Greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. This is one in our ongoing series of what we call our Pacific Connections Lectures. And why do we call them Pacific Connections Lectures? It's because the Arboretum is creating a new set of gardens down at the south end called the Pacific Connections Gardens. And it's featuring five uh, ecosystems from around the Pacific Rim, Australia, New Zealand, China, Cascadia, and Chile, all places that have climates relatively similar to ours, latitudes north or south similar to ours, and we're creating fabulous gardens and forests that will radiate, radiate out from them on a 14-acre site. So Frank, Frank came to Dr. Watt's lecture and he said, no, I was a senior at the University of Washington when the R.H. Thompson Freeway was, Expressway was going to go in. We students were looking for some way to be activists. 1972, right? It was the time when well, some of us did things like that. <laughs> We won't say what we did. <laughs> He's now an attorney in Stanwood, and he has a story to tell you about how that awful roadway that nearly ran down the west side of the Arboretum and nearly did as much damage to us as 520 did a decade earlier, how it was stopped. <laughs> and if he leaves us any time, I'll tell you a little bit of a story about how we picked up his mantle to make sure that when 520 gets expanded next year and the year after, the Arboretum gets some good things out of it. Right. Thank you, Paige and Rhonda, for inviting me to be here tonight. And uh, let's see, my, my old friend Al Seidenberg, he's here. I knew Al from back in that period. And uh, I was trying to think of a, of a name for this talk, a lecture. I'm a little allergic to that word, but uh, I, I call it the Bridge to Nowhere. And I think we all do. We've driven by it a, a million times over the years. And, and seen it out there and kind of wondered why it's there and, and uh, um, what's the, I guess what's to become of it is they're going to take it down for $7.2 million, at least that's proposed in the budget. But um, the, my story is, is just a little vignette. It's my connection to the, 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 the greater activist activity here in Seattle by lots and lots of people, hundreds of people, who endeavored in the 60s and 70s to stop the R.H. Thompson Expressway from going through our beloved Arboretum. And uh, most of us, when we became aware of it, couldn't even believe that the city of Seattle and uh, the Department of Transportation were going to try something like this. But they were. And I'm, I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about our experience in, stop, in attempting to stop that and, and ultimately doing that. So if you don't know the history, I, I have a, 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 just a, a brief couple of paragraphs here by John Stevens and, uh, let's see, this is uh, uh, Walt Crowley. And Walt Crowley has passed away, but I, I hear he's still, his, his uh, yeah. widow is uh, still active in, in his pursuits. So anyway, uh, and, and this, this talks about the I-5 uh, being a, con a concrete monstrosity that has long divided Seattle into two absurdly disconnected halves like the result of a brain operation gone horribly awry. <laughs> uh, it was never a civic inev inevitability, but uh, long before its official completion in January of 67, uh, citizens, activists, and elected officials alike fought for a better solution to, this, to the city's emerging need for a major transportation corridor that would connect Seattle with other major cities on the West Coast. 
Unfortunately, in 1956, the Washington State Highway Department trumped local desires for a sane solution, such as building the Seattle segment uh, of I-5 on the east side of Lake Washington, which was much less inhabited at, at that time, underdeveloped, they said. Um, and we're still left with the garish results of that dreadful lack of foresight today. I can remember my aunt lived up on, the, on Capitol Hill when they were, uh, when they put in um, the, the freeway in 1956, and, and uh, we'd go over and we'd watch these, these huge, magnificent homes either being uh, um, destroyed or carted away. And my uncle actually bought one and moved it down the hill, down on Del Mar, and, and stuck it in there as a rental. But uh, it was, you know, some people had some beautiful houses that they lost, and that's the way it goes, I guess. Fortunately, 11 years later, so that would have been uh, 1967, a group of citizen activists, appalled by the results of, this, of the decision to build I-5 in the heart of the city, organized a series of protests against uh, what would have been a much greater infrastructure disaster, namely the R.H. Thompson Expressway. At the time... At the time, still under proposal, the Thompson Expressway, if completed, would have followed Lake Washington's shoreline throughout Seattle, uh, running north from Interstate 90 through the Central District, Mont Lake, the University of Washington Arboretum, and ominously onward through Lake City to an interchange with an also proposed Bothell Freeway. <laughs> Now, maybe uh, when we're all sitting in traffic, we might think that's a great idea now, but you know, we all know that it would be a horrible idea to have it here. Uh, the first of these protests occurred on the date in focus here, and what they have a picture of the May 4th, 1969 uh, uh, protest that uh, marchers went through the Arboretum, and uh, they say that there were several thousand who marched through the Arboretum at that time. and so. That is a year before the time period that I'm going to tell you about. And they, um, so they protested the expressway's impending construction. Uh, the initial expressway proposal named for Seattle's erstwhile city engineer, Reginald Heber Thompson, he was 1856 to 1949, was approved by Seattle voters in 1960. So, State and city thought they had the go-ahead on this, but when inevitable changes of the plan uh, in, in which much of Mott Lake would have been bulldozed were revealed in 1996, Citizens Against R.H. Thompson organized to oppose the, product, the, the project. Excuse me. And uh, it says, uh, these protests were eventually successful, benefiting greatly from the local environmental movement that had emerged since 1965. In February 72, a special election ballot referendum was passed in Seattle that withdrew funding for the Thompson project. Finally, in 77, June of 77, the city council voted officially to cancel R.H. Thompson Expressway, thus bringing a joyful closure to a crucial episode of local grassroots, grassroots uh, activist history. So, so. The point there is it was an extremely long time and uh, lots of people put in lots of work over, over this period, uh, never really knowing uh, because you're depending on uh, the, the Seattle City bureaucracy, University of Washington, State of Washington, all these things to, to undo something that they had set in motion. One of the big problems is they had the money they, uh, you know, they were using eminent domain to, uh, to, to buy up right away along the side of the Arboretum here. And this is one of the things we ran into was uh, uh, unhappy people when we got involved uh, who, I, I think there were some people who came in and, and bought some properties uh, and thinking that they were going to, uh, you know, sell them, you know, have, get a good appraisal and all that kind of thing, and uh, and, and make some money. And, and when we protesters got involved and tried to shut this thing down, uh, they got pretty mad. And uh, as as just as, as a vignette, I had uh, uh, well anyway, people people told me that there were three 
thug kind of guys looking for me when I was in the middle of this. So, you know, that was it. And, and I don't know who it was. I, I laid low. I never did see him. But, you know, that, that kind of thing was, was going on. So, uh, to the, the, the picture that I want to give you then is, is how, uh, how I became involved in this with my little group from the University of Washington and, and some other groups. And, um, and, and basically what we wound up uh, bringing together was a, uh, of course we had Citizens Against R.H. Thompson and they were called uh, CART. And, and they had been battling this uh, for a long time as, as well as a couple of uh, local environmental groups. And uh, it, it, I, guess I, I guess I better go back a little bit. Um, my involvement started in uh, 1969 around <coughs> when my cousin Steve Boyd got elected student body president at the U. He and I were both seniors at the U, and so, <coughs> excuse me, um, I got to be, uh, through nepotism, whatever, uh, on his part of his uh, governing group at the University of Washington, the students. And uh, so we decided, and a lot of us were anti-war protesters, and so there was a lot of energy around that, but we were feeling very frustrated that uh, no matter how hard we tried to do anything, the federal government would not listen. And so we thought, well, how can we put our energies into uh, something in the community that might be beneficial to the community? So that, that, was, that was our thought. And uh, to sort of accomplish that, I was sent back to an education, it was an educational reform conference at Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois, uh, over Thanksgiving of uh, 1969. And at that uh, conference, there were uh, members of uh, colleges and universities from across the country, and they were all there trying to figure out how uh, colleges and universities and, and their students could be relevant within their own communities. And uh, part of who was there uh, in order to work that uh, were representatives from Solomon's <coughs> Uh, grassroots organizing uh, uh, organization in Chicago. And um, let's see, uh, so, so they were there. So, so we, went, we went through this, uh, uh, it was kind of a week-long thing for Thanksgiving, and, and I'm, I met a couple of organizers from Saul Linsky's Institute, and you know, uh, Barack Obama was uh, connected with Saul Linsky. You know, and uh, he's just a community organizer. Look what that got him. <laughs> and so, so we were we were doing a little community. You know, we wanted to learn about community organizing, and so uh, we decided that we would have a uh, a, a get together in Seattle to to try to uh, do some community organizing, but to, but that we needed to identify what what, what project we were going to work on. And, and who would be involved, and, and, and we had to get organized. So uh, we contacted Saul Linsky and these two people that I met, and uh, they said that they would come out uh, if we would pay their airfare and their stipend. And so great, so I went, I went back to the uh, uh, UW uh, Student um, Board of Control and I said, uh, you know, I want to put on a program that's, that's going to aid the community and, and we want to do some organizing. And of course, everyone on the left was really in favor of it, and everyone on the right, like the, uh, uh, the fraternities, they were absolutely against it. But anyway, I talked them out of uh, 325 bucks. <laughs> okay, and what can you do with 325 bucks? Well, the Solomonsky people agreed to fly out standby for 25 weeks. Okay. So that's, that, that's a 100 bucks round trip, two people from back and forth to Chicago. <coughs> then they had, to, they had to get a stipend or an honorarium or something as had to, and usually they charged 100 bucks each. Well, they agreed to take uh, 100 bucks for both of them. 
And they also needed uh, transportation and they needed uh, uh, food and lodging. So originally we were going to uh, try to use a dorm at the university and, and have some space there. The university said no, absolutely not. If this is anything you know that could be political or whatever, no. And they even gave us a bad time about the ASUW funds that we were using, but we asserted that those were student funds, not university funds. Keep your hands off. We get to do with it what we want. And so anyway, so um, we, we got them to come out. Uh, uh, my car was a 60, desert beige 64 Chevy. That was the car that went out to the airport and picked them up, brought them back, went to the store, got all the groceries. We went down to uh, uh, the Pike Place Market, the Farmer's Market, and uh, we had a couple of Oh, the place that we got was uh, um, basically kind of a commune that our group had <laughs> that was over here in Montlake, about a half mile from here. It was a nice house, very nice house. And um, so they, a couple of the people there were good cooks, and they so they told me what, uh, you know, we're going to have 300 people here for three or four days. We're going to need food and all that sort of thing. And so we're going to just have some good old hippie food. And so they sent me down there with 75 bucks. I got 30 pounds of stew meat. I got big jars of peanut butter. I got brown rice. I got all kinds of vegetables, everything for 75 bucks, threw in the 64 Chevy, brought them back. And they, you know, we had a group in there and they started cooking things up. And we had, uh, we had 30 gallons of, uh, of stew that lasted us through this long weekend. <laughs> well, anyway, and, and we and we also got our got our people out here too. And, uh, another little aside to this was that uh, uh, being up at the hub, uh, involved in uh, student government, I was in the departmental affairs committee. It was our big <laughs> our big title. But um, uh, there was a local journalist uh, at the PI who was an education writer, and he insisted on barging in, you know, three times a week to find out what, what we were up to. Well, that was Frank Herbert, the, the science fiction writer of uh, the novel the Dune series. And, uh, and so I wound up becoming his contact at the university. So, uh, okay, and, and uh, other people got to know that Frank, you know, was wanting to know what we were doing, and, and we were a little bit worried. It was, you know, don't trust anybody over 30, and uh, you know, but Frank was at, Frank, he was in his 50s at the time, but he was a really good guy, a really cool guy. But, uh, you know, he he had he had written his book, uh, Dune had been published, but it hadn't taken off at all, and so he was, he was uh, uh, you know, always talking about what the, uh, the the themes and the plots were, and how it was uh, environmentalist, and all this kind of stuff, and, and try to get us excited about maybe buying his book or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, um, we we so we, we planned this uh, this meeting, and everybody was saying, "Well, oh, don't tell Frank, don't tell Frank, Frank Herbert, you know, because he's you know he's he's he'll come in and he'll take over to dominate, and then, then he might he might write things in the paper that we don't want him to write." So, uh, so I, I kept telling Frank, oh, Frank knew that this big meeting was coming up and, and he was hounding me about it. So finally I, I acknowledged that yeah, we were having the meeting in, uh, in, in Montlake and he knew where it was and uh, that it was starting Friday and it was running through, uh, well, through Sunday and that we really would appreciate it if he wouldn't show up till about noon on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he abided by that. He did. And uh, so um, basically what happened was the, uh, the, um, the people, from the, the trainers from Saul Linsky's Institute got into town and everybody was busy with all their things and we had, we had uh, uh, local citizen activists, like I was saying, we had uh, uh, the Citizens Against R.H. Thompson. We had uh, two or three environmental groups that were involved. Maybe some of you were involved in, in those groups at that time. We had the Sierra Club. We had the Audubon Society. We had the uh, AS Associated Students University of Washington. That was us. We had the Seattle Garden Club. 
We had uh, Montlake uh, residents, we had Broadmoor residents, uh, we had uh, Madrona residents, and we had Central District residents, and we had the Black Panthers. <laughs> we had these guys, we, had, we, we were in the midst of our thing, and, and four or five uh, big Black Panthers came in and they had, they had their berets on, and they had uh, black leather jackets, and they were very polite, and they were concerned uh, not only about the Arboretum, but about uh, this, this R.H. Thompson uh, going through the Central District. And uh, so it, it was, it, uh, and they didn't bring their shotguns or anything. And, and, and that was another thing. We decided, because there were lots of, what was going on right at the time when, when all this, when this was happening, when we had to deal with this major, major issue in Seattle history, um, we had the invasion of Cambodia, Richard Nixon, of course, and we had the, uh, the killings at Kent State. And the killings at Kent State, I don't know if you, if you guys were around, but it just, it, we just went bananas, the students. At the May University. 1970. Yes, May 1970. That's all this is happening in May 1970. And so we had the tax squad in the U District. We had uh, uh, Wes Ullman talking to everybody, trying to count everybody mm -hmm. down in front of City Hall. And Wes Ullman, by the way, was in, in favor of, of this R.H. Thompson. You know, he was, he was a big, big promoter of it. Uh, but anyway, uh, and, and then that was when, the, when the, the, uh, all the protesters went onto the freeway and, and blocked both lanes of the freeway, north and south, and hiked back up to the, up to the U District. And I have to say, I was in the front of the line. And, <laughs> uh, I was there. Yeah. And, and we got up to we got up to the 45th off ramp, and there was a talk. The, the tax squad was was spread out on the uh, northbound lanes, and they had uh, laid out tear gas canisters, and to to keep us from going up the freeway, so we would get off at 45th. Well, it just so happens that and they were there with their gas masks and everything that the wind was blowing and the wind was blowing the gas back on them and we just came cruising by you know just, just walked up the offer <laughs> and they're just under this cloud of gas but i i guess they thought that they had won that one but it was uh, it, it was pre it was pretty funny to see so uh so there, there uh, we were back in back over here at at, uh, at our little house in Montlake with about I don't know it seemed like it, like there were the, the the number of people ranged from 50 to 200 depending on what was going on and um, so we we decided and and my perspective in in directing the meeting was that uh, we wanted to pick a project that was uh, an environmental project that would benefit the community. And so even though I knew about R.H. Thompson and I was in favor of us, you know, uh, voting to, uh, to try to stop R.H. Thompson, uh, I, I knew, I mean, I felt that it had to be a democratic decision and that, there, that other points of view had to be considered about other projects. And so um, Frank Herbert actually, when he came, he suggested that we, tr that we try to shut down the Asarco smelter in Tacoma. He was originally from Tacoma, and, and of course it was a terrible thing that is shut down now and, and cleaned up. But um, that, so he was pushing for that. And then uh, another group there was pushing to try to uh, correct the pollution problems in Puget Sound. And of course that's a long-term ongoing thing and, and a very laudable project. And then the, and then the, the third uh, choice on our ballot was uh, to try to do something to stop the R.H. Thompson Expressway. Well, um, and we, we knew that time was critical on the R.H. Thompson and I wondered if there was enough time at all to, re to realistically do anything. Like in my law practice now, if somebody came in to me and said, oh, okay, there's a major road construction project that's a freeway, and they have all the money, and they bought all the property, and they have all the, all the uh, construction guys are ready to go, 
Um, and uh, this is Sunday, and it's going to start on Thursday. What can you do? I would say, you know, I, I think you're out of luck. And so in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, you know, this is a, a, a David and Goliath battle. You know, it's, just, it's something that I don't know if we can do it, but by God, we have to try. And so... And so I gave, uh, so, so everybody, Frank Herbert gave his speech, everybody gave their speech, and, and I gave my speech. And, and in my speech, I advocated that we try to stop the R.H. Thompson. And I, and I said, uh, and, oh, and we had, we'd been having training by the Alinsky people all weekend, you know, training in, in uh, uh, different techniques and, 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 and how you, uh, uh, how you actually get to the seat of power and make things move, and uh, and, and the the model that we that they had been teaching over the weekend was a model that they had successfully used in Chicago in stopping Commonwealth Edison, big power company there, from putting a, um, a huge power line right through the middle of a poor neighborhood. And they were successful in doing that. And so they told us everything that they, all the techniques that they used to stop that. And, and of course, um, uh, one of the, uh, of the techniques, well, the, the, the major, well, the way it developed was that uh, uh, we decided that we would contact, I'm getting ahead of myself, okay. Uh, so, so, that, so before the vote, then uh, I gave Frank gave his speech, and then I gave my speech. And so he's we're in the living room, and a group of people like this, and he's sitting right on the floor right there, you know. And he's so excited, he's just all he, he was in his fifties and, and kind of short cropped hair and a big full beard and, and just bounced around, you know. He he was. Uh, uh, very, uh, very much engaged, and, and he loved to see us, us doing this. So anyway, in, in my talk, um, I said that that uh, this the, the arboretum is such a treasure, and, and it, it's something that's going to be so important to Seattle for generations upon generations. That uh, if, if even if we lose, if we don't take this opportunity to try to stop these guys. Because, I mean, really, they know not what they do. They didn't. They didn't know. The, uh, you know, Wes Ullman and the state and University of Washington and, and, and all that. Oh, that's, that's another thing. Uh, we, knew, we knew that, that the foundation and, and our breeding here could not get involved because of their, uh, you know, the, 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 the structure of, uh, of ownership and control here which is the city of Seattle and the University of Washington. And so they were quietly rooting on the sidelines for us. Um, but uh, the, uh, we, we came to find out that the, uh, let's see, what, the faculty senate at the University of Washington, our professors, our trusted mentors, who had taught us everything about life and how to live it and, and how, to, how to pursue a, a, a a lifestyle and a livelihood and all that kind of stuff. Those guys had voted for the R.H. Thompson Expressway. The university had approved it. And the city of Seattle, the city council, well, they were all behind it. State of Washington, you know, uh, the, the, they were all behind it. And, and they, like I said, they had the money, they had everything. And, you know, we thought, Boy, the professors, the professors, uh, they just don't see it. They don't know. And it was, it, it, was, it was like a maturity moment. It was like, okay, they really don't know the truth here. And uh, we hate to go against them, but we're going to have to. So, so, we, so anyway, I gave my speech. And in my speech, I, I said, uh, you know, the way I see for this thing to be organized that might be successful if, if we can get past this first hurdle, which is the construction thing, that started imminently, uh, is, is to organize ourselves like a Muslim jihad. 
And nobody had ever heard of a Muslim jihad before. Well, I had heard of a Muslim jihad because I was a philosophy major as a senior, and in, in philosophy 403, uh, philosophy of religion, taught by John Chandless, who is one of the greatest professors I've ever had. Do you guys know him? Yeah, well, anyway, uh, uh, John Chambliss had, uh, he, was, he was teaching this course, and, and he had just taught us about this, this concept of jihad. Well, from what he taught us, the concept of jihad is a peaceful one, and it's, it's a, a concept of uh, everybody working to do their best, whatever they can do, to their ability to, uh, to, to do a beneficial thing for the community. Like you pick a project and everybody contributes however they can. And so in my mind, you know, that was the ladies in the garden club could talk to their neighbors, talk to their group, uh, write letters, um, make telephone calls. Everybody could do that. And, and everybody, the uh, uh, like uh, Citizens Against R.H. Thompson, they already had experience with the politicos. The environmentalists already kind of knew what was going on there. And, uh, and so I, I said that the only, in my mind, for this to work, it's got to be decentralized. And everybody just goes out and you just impact the whole community and everybody just does whatever they can. And your goal is to stop that R.H. Thompson Expressway. And, you know, peacefully, but, you know, in any way you can. So, uh, so, so Frank was taking notes on this. Well, we, 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 took our, we took our vote, we took our vote, and sure enough, R.H. Thompson became our cause celeb. And as soon as we decided that... And what was the vote? How close was it? It was almost unanimous. Almost unanimous. And, and, we, had, and we had representatives of all these groups uh, that, that, that were voting. And, and you know, maybe about 200 people voted. And, and I would say that you know that one or two that, that were uh, promoting the other issues, you know, voted for their own issue. But everybody saw that there was a critical need. We all realized, you know, it was we had a snowball's chance in hell. But you know, we, we just uh, I don't I don't know. Maybe it's that youthful optimism. You know, you just you, you just have to go for it. You know, you just just you can't let it stop. I mean, now I'm 65 now. You know, I say, well, okay, kids. You know, I don't think this is going to work. <laughs> but at the time, so 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 again. Then as soon as we as soon as we identified what we needed to do, the um, uh, our trainers from Saul Lisky's Institute, well, they just they jumped up and we had easels with charts and papers and all that kind of stuff all over and magic markers and and, and we were we were laying down a plan that we had to hit at 8 o'clock Monday morning, uh, right up until our, our, our deadline was 7 o'clock Thursday night. That's when construction was going to start. And so, uh, so we laid out this plan, and everybody exchanged information. We didn't have computers then, but everybody, uh, everybody we had phones and typewriters and all that sort of thing. So everybody, <laughs> I know, that's a million years ago. But, but it, and we didn't have any money. You know, all these other guys had money, and, and uh, so, uh, uh, so, so we laid out, we got out uh, a bunch of phone books, and we went through, and uh, we identified every person that we could think of who was in, who was in the uh, somehow connected to the chain of command or control for starting that construction project. And so, so we had, uh, of course, the, the local representatives uh, around here that we knew of. We had the city council. We had uh, uh, Wes Allman, the mayor. Um, and, and then, and, and we identified who our, our congressmen were and, and Congress people, and uh, I, I believe was Dan Evans the governor then? I think yeah. And, and then we had uh, Scoop Jackson and Warren Magnuson in D.C. Okay, and, and so we had we had a list that was uh, deep and broad of everybody who needed to be contacted and told. Stop this construction! Don't let it happen. Uh, it's a it's a horrible idea. 
uh, the people are against it. All the people are against it. And uh, it may be a little hyperbole there, but most of the people <laughs> are against it. So on Monday morning, you know, everybody, and, and, and since we were decentralized, it was, oh, oh, and then, and then we decided that, uh, that since uh, citizens uh, against R.H. Thompson and the, environment, the environmentalists had been involved so long that they would probably be good for uh, tactics and strategy, and so we put them in charge, but it was, it was still, uh, there was still no centralized uh, head, you know, there was nobody, you, could, you couldn't lock off a head here and, and stop us, you know, because of, the rest would, would go, and, and so uh, I, I tell you, I made, I made 15 calls on Monday myself, and I think everybody else did, and, uh, and we just kept it up, and we just went up and down the chain of command, everybody, if, if they were a, a little bit player or a big deal, they were all contacted, and we just kept it up, we kept it up, we, we did it relentlessly, and let's see, so... So we're, 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 we're doing this without getting much feedback. I mean, we're, we're getting a little feedback about, well, okay, some people are listening and some people, uh, you know, some of these leaders are sort of caring about it a little bit, but, uh, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not getting anything definitive from anybody. So, um, so he says, uh, so anyway, so, so we, we kept it up, kept it up, kept it up. And then Thursday evening, Right over here, you all probably drove by it while you were coming in there, where, where the ramp is, the ramp that the ramp that comes there has been there for 43 years. Okay, well, it, we, we gathered down there about 5 o'clock, and, uh, and, and they were supposed to start work at 7, start in the evening. And they had uh, dump trucks. There were probably five or six big dump trucks, and they had three big bulldozers, like D8 or D9 cats, and they were there. And then they had water trucks, and they had their fuel trucks, and it looked like an army that was there, ready to, I mean, ready to start a project, all these hard hat guys around and all that. There was a small contingent of Seattle police and the Seattle police, I think they were, they were uh, you know, this wasn't a big anti-war protest or anything. It was just about a road and all that. And I, 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 think, I think they were they were going through a little bit of, uh, I don't know, shock or something, you know, having a deal because this, this May had just been crazy with, you know, the tax squad, the U district, and the, uh, you know, people on the freeway and all this kind of stuff. And so I think they were hoping that this was not going to be one of those, and so they were, they were keeping a low profile off to the side. They weren't there in front with their gas masks and their truncheons and all that. They were over off to the side. And so and as, uh, as the time came up, I'm thinking, oh my God, it looks like they're going to do this. And, you know, we kept waiting for word, waiting for word. No word came from anybody, and so... How many of you were there? There were, oh, there were about 300 of us, maybe four, three to 400. And I, and I have to say that the environmentalists, and there were some, some young, uh, well, we were all young, but, you know, like some 18, 19, 20-year-old girls who were in the environmental group. And uh, I, I was graduating, and I already had a trip planned to Europe. And so the thought of getting arrested was not really something that I wanted to think about. But these girls, they're saying, okay, we got some, we got some chains and stuff and some locks. We're going to chain ourselves together in front of those bulldozers. Yeah. And I'm going, well, God, if you guys do it, I'm going to have to do it too. <laughs> and so... And so, and so there, there it was. It, it, you know, so, so we all started edging closer, edging closer, edging closer, because we'd been across the street and everything had been back. And so this was kind of crunch time. And so uh, the, the operators uh, for all the equipment at about 6.45 or so, they all climb up into the cabs of their rigs. And they're all talking on the radio and stuff like that. 
We're going, oh no, okay. So, so we start getting ourselves organized. How are we going to do this? Are we going to lay down it? Oh, and we and we had pledged nonviolence, you know, absolutely nonviolence, because there were some people there who wanted to monkey wrench this thing, the monkey wrench gang, you know, where you sabotage and all that. We says, no way, no way. This is just going to be. This has to be peaceful. There's no other alternative here. And, and, and so, you know, you guys, uh, oh, and people want to put sugar in the gas tank and all that. But we said, no, we're not doing any of that stuff. This is all going to be peaceful. And uh, and these little, these little girls, you know, they're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, what's going on? But they were getting their chains on and they were getting ready to go. And uh, so it's 6.45 and it's 7 o'clock. Here are all these big bulldozers all rumble to life. And, and I thought, well, sh this is, you know, this is bad. This is, we're not going to have any luck here. Okay, so, so they rumble to life. And so they, they sat there rumbling, 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 but nothing, nobody went. And so we're, we're ready just, to, just to, at the time that they were going to move, we were going to go lay down in front of all the bulldozers. Okay, and so they idled there for about 45 minutes. And then three of them shut their, shut their motors off. And there's still about five of them going like that. But what is going on? And then, and then about, so that, was, that was 7.45, about 8.15, 8.15, the other ones turned their motors off. And we're like, we we didn't know if, if we should be elated or not, but we thought we should. And so, you know, since since we were nonviolent and all that, we just we just asked one of the operators, you know, what's going on? Oh, he says, uh, yeah, he says, uh, I guess you guys won tonight. He says, uh, uh, we got a call and uh, we're postponed until uh, Monday night at seven. And this was Thursday night, so over the weekend. So something in what we had done had got some power, some some people in this in this power curve, you know, had got them to say, uh oh, looks like something's going on here. And so let's give us some time to think about it. Well, we kept up our full court press with phone calls and all that kind of stuff, just kept going, going, going. And we thought, well, we're gonna have to be out here Monday night again, same thing. Monday during the day came out of the uh, mayor's office. Oh, we're going to uh, postpone this for two weeks now. We've got some technical things we've got to uh, think about and all that. Well, then, then that that two weeks then became another two weeks, and then it became another, a, a couple of months. And uh, uh, it, oh, and, and when when the when the motors when the motors went off, everybody in unison just cheered. It was like we had done something. And we didn't quite know how we'd done it, but, but it worked. And then uh, after that, uh, people in, in the community and all that just, just kept this pressure up. I don't know. It was, it was because it was everybody was given the task themselves to monitor themselves and, and, and to try to do this and uh, to, to try to, to keep the pressure on and to try to stop Maurice Thompson. And, uh, and and by golly, it worked. We just kept stopping it, stopping it, stopping it. And finally, uh, Wes Ullman and uh, the city council, I think the uh, I, I think the, the garden club really gave him an earful. <laughs> um, that they uh, uh, finally they said, uh, okay, we're just gonna. Uh, they they felt like they were loggerheads. Uh, we're going to have to just turn this over to a vote of the people by referendum. And they did. And the people of the city of Seattle said, no way. You're not putting that thing in. And even so, that, oh, so, so the referendum actually defunded, defunded it so they wouldn't have money to do this. Um, but the city council didn't actually put the, the permanent kibosh on this until uh, 1977, which was another five years. So that just shows you how slowly these bureaucracies move. Do you remember what the vote was on the referendum, percentage-wise? 
Well, I, I'm sure it was, I, I don't know, I think it was 64%. No, against the freeway. Against it, yeah. Is that, is that kind of what you recall? Yeah. I was just curious. Yeah, I think I think it was it, it was a, a, a significant majority. Yeah, and anyway, and and so uh, it, it, some somehow the uh, somehow the will of the people through perseverance uh, overcame this uh, this great bureaucratic inertia that had been. Uh, had, had been set in motion, and it was just, you know, today with all the things that we face, uh, the, the, the people are against and all that, that the, the bureaucrats or, or whatever, you know, the, the powers that be that they want to do, it, it just, it, it's so hard uh, for um, true personal democracy to, to overcome, but this is an example of a time when it did. And, uh, and and so that that really is uh, is something that I carry with me. That, you know how how marvelous it was, and it was thousands of people, thousands of Seattle citizens uh, of every walk of life doing whatever they could to uh, to to try to stop something that would have been a real tragedy. And so that that's kind of the. My part about about what what I was uh, in to stop that, and, and then and aside to that is this connection with Frank Herbert that um, that I just want to share with you, and, and um, so so I, I knew Frank, and, and after that I, I went to Europe and did and, and uh, you know came back and kind of continued to work on things, and I lost touch with Frank. Well. Uh, my wife and I were up in uh, Port Townsend and uh, I started practicing law in, in Stanwood and, and I was over in Port Townsend about 83 at a restaurant on the water and I heard this commotion going on and I looked over and there was Frank Herbert and I hadn't seen him for 12 years or so and uh, I said oh and, and he was raising heck about uh, somebody uh, oh they put salt in his wife's food and and uh, she had a medical condition that, that couldn't uh, handle salt and so he was he was uh, getting down on pretty good and he was in the, in the middle of a tirade actually and I went over you know kind of when he finished I said Frank it's, it's me Frank Butler from uh, um, the R.H. Thompson you know University of Washington and he looks at me and, and he looks at his wife and he says he says, dear, he says, this is Frank Butler. He's the Butlerian Jihad. <laughs> <laughs> and well, I didn't know what to think of that. And I uh, introduced my wife and everything. He says, uh, he says, I hope you don't mind. He says, but he says, I revised my book in, uh, in let's see, I guess it was 1997. It was the Berkeley edition. And he says, I put you in it. <laughs> I said, okay, and so anyway, so I'm going to just show you two things. Okay, this, 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 is, a, this is a book written by his son after he died, and, and it's called uh, Dune, the Butlerian Jihad. <laughs> I'm just going to read to you, you know, you know, Frank was into all different kinds of uh, uh, religions and, and uh, of course, the environment and, and that sort of thing. And, and uh, so, he, you know, so this idea of jihad, I think, really intrigued him. And, and, and I, think he was, I think he was impressed by our whole group and what we were able to accomplish, you know. And so, and that, so the credit goes to the group, you know, that, that participated in this. In this thing, but I just I just want to read you here what uh, this this is in his uh, 77th edition, the Berkeley edition of uh, of Dune by Frank Herbert, and he's got a glossary back here, and he talks about uh, uh, the Butlerian what Butlerian Jihad in the book, uh, what it's about, and he says it's uh, also see the Great Revolt, and then it says uh, it's the Crusade against computers. Thinking machines and conscious robots 
begun in 201 BG and concluded in, in 108 BG, its, <laughs> its chief commandment remains in the OC Bible as, Thou shalt not make a machine in the likeness of a human mind. So Frank was all over the place, you know. But <laughs> that was uh, so that that's why so so that's why this this kind of thing lives with me. Kind of carry you know I kind of carry it on and, and I get a, a kick out of uh, out of these books and things. So anyway, well thank you very much for. Marvelous to have it, and Al Wagar has captured it all on tape. So we're going to have it in our archives. You're not allowed to go. The University of Washington will have a copy, and the Arboretum Foundation will have a copy, so that people after us will know what it was that these folks accomplished to help us save the Arboretum. I know you guys have got to have some questions about this in one of those talks. So, yeah. I'm sorry that you didn't come come out on me and not like we're trying to fight the fight funny because everybody said it can't be done. Washtag is against us, Belgium is against us, and those of us who were involved. So they, the same, they were the same players at the time yes. before. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah, this story would have really. Resonated, I think, in Seattle, and maybe brought back out. Well, I'm sorry, I, I wasn't available. But. <laughs> yes. You mentioned the, the faculty uh, being poor there, Rich Thompson. Actually, I want to clear that up. Okay, oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I, 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 I'm sorry if I offended anybody on the faculty or anything like that, because I know there were people on faculty who were who were on our side. I just want to say the person who really led CART and who organized this community. Professor of Mathematics, or uh, Maynard Armstrong. Great, great, and then, yeah. And then there yeah. was another faculty member who lived in a hit house over here who discovered. Don Gibbs. Don Gibbs. He was from Chinese studies. He was Don Gibbs. Who discovered that uh, the highway department was buying houses, yes. lending them, uh, releasing them on a 30 day lease with no maintenance, with the idea of reducing the value of the houses in the neighborhood mm -hmm. so they could buy as many as they wanted to as yeah. cheaply as possible. Yeah. And that was what really turned this community around. So there was, Ourself's daughter is here. That's me. And that's you. Um, there was also a lot of pro bono legal assistance. I'm sure there was. From faculty at the law school. Oh, good for them. There were hours and hours um, devoted week upon week for years on this and strategy meetings and you know political liaisons and legal challenges. Um, it was an immense effort. It's great to hear about um, the piece of the disability. This was uh, uh, well, an I'm, amazing amount of time back. Yeah. I mean, there were and I'd like to learn more about that. that uh, I really would. And there's some good, good um, somebody at Seattle who did a, a thesis on this and lays out a lot of history and a lot of the behind the scenes with the newspapers and, um, you know, um, it was just a tremendous effort that went on for a long period of time. Yeah, I, I knew there was a, a forestry professor as well that was uh, helping us, and, and, and I mean, I knew there were there were individual. Uh, this man here was involved, right? You were in her. Yeah. And your Bill. name, sir, is Bill McCoy. Bill McCoy. But my vivid memory in high school, when we didn't have internet, um, was never being able to get back home from the rent at night. Because <laughs> <laughs> my father was on it every single night. Um, well, good for him. You know, and are you writing something up about that? Because this, um, this is a history. Know, I mean, it, it is a history, and there are a lot of it, you know, that's been written in bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. um, um, that's available, but um, also just the referendum that happened it wasn't the city council putting it on the ballot. That was the collecting signatures. Huge oh, a huge, yeah. To okay. get it on the ballot, you know, requisite numbers. So it was, um, it was huge. It's, it's been great.
great and interesting to hear your piece and that extra, you know, mm -hmm. the visibility and, and the broadening of the movement. I think is terrific. Yeah. It really did, you know, I mean, it really was a quintessential citizen's effort. Well, thank your dad and, and, and all of his colleagues. Yeah, he, he passed away a couple of years ago, but it was, I think, really quite a legacy. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Since this, you, it sounds like your effort really stopped the project at the start. I want to know about the ramps. How did the ramps come into being mm -hmm. and stopped in the middle like they have? In all these years. Well, I, I, I think they I think they put in the floating bridge. I don't know this for sure, but I'm, I'm, maybe somebody does it. They put in the floating bridge and, and they they just had all the hookups, you know, that they were going to so, have later. So 520 went through around 1959-60, and and the plan was to connect 520 going east west with this expressway the R.H. Thompson that was planned to go north-south. So the ramps were put in as the intended connectors to the expressway that would come later. But that was, they were put in at the time of the Yes. Yeah. And, and so, they have, there, so okay. they have sat there since 1960. And when we're done with questions, if you want to know about the fate of the ramps, I can tell you the 2012-13 story about how they're going away. Yeah. Dwight? Um, how important do you think the spirit of activism of the 70s, of the Vietnam War era, was to the broad engagement uh, that uh, you were able to muster around this issue? And how, when you think about it, is that different today? No, oh, well, I, I think at, at that time it was very important, and I, and, and just knowing the, the my student milieu, you know, that I was in, the, the frustration everybody who was sort of in the anti-war camp felt in in, in really not being able to um, uh, affect uh, national policy very well. Okay, and so uh, and, and so there was this, this, so we all had this frustration, and we had this energy, and and uh, we felt like. We wanted to do something that was going to have an impact, a lasting impact. That uh, and, and we, we didn't we didn't feel like our, our effort to say stop the war uh, was really uh, producing any fruit. And so and, and so I think the frustration of the time and the energy and the willingness and and all that uh, really contributed to what we were able to accomplish because people kept it up. They just kept it up, and, and the professionals were. I mean, everybody was involved. Uh, you know, it was quite admirable. And, and how it affects today, I don't know. It, it's uh, uh, what's the new generation of the millennials, or who's in, uh, you know, who are the students now that would be uh, that you would be uh, having help you? I mean, it, it seems like you need young energy to uh, to kind of uh, that, that uh, is optimistic. Ultimately optimistic about uh, about things, you know, not kind of beaten down and, and with thoughts that, that things can't work. Um, but but I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I think I think the, the modern younger generation does care and and they can get engaged. Uh, and, and we know they can sure communicate. You know, I think I think I think the the, the new uh, communication uh, advances uh, could really help you get organized. You know, like if we could have done a flash mob or different things like that, that you know, that would have been pretty amazing. But uh, but I, I don't know that that people now have the have, have the, the, the same sense of uh, of urgency about things. Do you? Do you have a sense of that? Yeah. Thank you. My question was, I was just curious if you or anyone else here knew where one could see a map of the, what was proposed. Because I, I live in a house um, that's, that's uh, south of the Arboretum, not too far off of Lake Washington Boulevard, and I'm just curious if there would have been a freeway through my house. You know, just to see the actual map. <laughs> 
involved in so. Well, I agree. Put together the ultimate collection of Montlake historic photos. I'm very fortunate to be the holder of it right now. There is an aerial photo over the arboretum, and superimposed upon it is the R.H. Thompson Expressway. I have done numerous slideshows with Audrey Hill's slides uh, in front of groups, and when they see that slide on the screen, uh, the R.H. Thompson going through the arboretum, people just gasp. It's unbelievable what could have happened. And thank God for Maynard Arso, Don Gibbs, Frank, and so many people who stopped that. Mm -hmm. yeah, but the photo exists. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm interested in some of this, this sort of spillover from the R.H. Thompson fight to the I-90 fight in Mount Baker in the central area uh, a little bit later on. My question is, did the Black Panthers they came to your organizing meeting. Did they show up at any of the other protests, or do you know uh, what yeah. role they might have? Were they there, ready to sit down in front of the bulldozers? Can you fill that they, in that well, picture I, a little bit? Well, you know, they may have been there. I, I, I don't recall them specifically being, uh, you know, they were loading their shotguns or whatever. But, uh, no, because no, we were nonviolent. But, uh, but they, I think, uh, to their credit, they were showing uh, support for their community. And, uh, and, and and we had a, a lot of you know kind of regular citizens from uh, the central district as well, and and they were doing their part in in our phoning and writing and and, uh, and that sort of thing. So, it, so yeah, there was ongoing African American. Ongoing, yeah, yeah, there was, yeah. What kind of data did you use as the basis for your arguments? Today we have a lot of studies that can document things and we hope that if we just have the numbers, the data will convince the decision makers for us. What, what did you use for resources? Uh, well, we, you know, there was nothing very, very uh, sophisticated. And it was it was mainly a, a gut thing and what we were trying to do was, was contact all these decision makers and, and tell them that, uh, that their their goal was uh, or, or their their plan um, was something that was not supported by the majority of the people now that uh, that what had been decided back in 1960 was no longer really relevant and that uh, that they hadn't taken into account uh, what the and this was the environmental movement sort of coming out we use a lot of environmental stuff uh, and, and and that, that they hadn't appreciated uh, what a treasure um, the arboretum was. She didn't go into the amount of detail that's in another history. Um, I couldn't find a reference, but she makes a reference to a history that's in the archives of Seattle University, and, and it is a history of uh, the battle of the citizens to uh, stave off this threat of a freeway through their neighborhood and the arboretum. Another question, and you're speaking about the, the Garden Lady and the Black Panthers. How many of those groups do you think came to that event beforehand knowing that that might be one of the issues? Or how many of them came to learn about organizing and then were motivated? Well, well I, I, would, I would say that um, a large percentage of the people, we, we had already kind of put the word out that uh, this, uh, that R.H. Thompson was uh, was on the agenda. Uh, we, we hadn't committed that we would actually try to fight it, but uh, I think people were coming hoping that they could join in if we did decide to fight it. And so, and, and so yeah, it, it, is, it does amaze me to this day, uh, you know, without computers and everything, and. Um, and iPhones that uh, we were able to get such a, a broadly based group of people together in pretty short order. Do you think the excuse me? I, I, oh, do you think the Stalinsky Stalinsky Institute later on used the Irish Thompson model as a as a recommended way of citizen activism? I, 
think they did incorporate it into their uh, their teaching model and, and, and what they actually did in, in communities. I, I think I think we uh, added a, another veneer of, uh, of experience to what they had, well, and, and I, I think I think they did count this as one of their successes. We should have named you. <laughs> well, I think another group that was rather influential were the people who had relatives in the cemetery, because that was one of the, the paths suggests it was right on the 35th. And I, I know there was very strong feeling there. And with that, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you.